Hola. So, uh, thank you for having me here, first and foremost. Uh, soy uh, intento un pequeño en español. Uh, <laughs> la vida es la cosa más importante en las vida, en la vida. Before I, before I begin, let me explain one thing about myself. Uh, besides being a preacher, I'm also what's called an apologist, and that's somebody who teaches and speaks on evidence for the faith. And so some of that's going to be sprinkled in. This might be a little different this morning. Hopefully you can uh, follow along on the sheets that's been given. But in living in our culture today, where truth has come under attack, the effects of not living in truth may vary, but ultimately they will never turn out for our good. So in 1 Kings 22, we're going to read most of this story, but it's recorded about a prophet who stood for truth in the midst of a whole group of people who chose to co-sign a lie. We're going to recount the story of a man that chose to tell the truth in a community of liars. This man chose to speak for God and not for himself. And we understand that in this culture and in life in general, that's a difficult thing to do sometimes, but it's always a necessary thing to do. Now, before we get into this story, we're going to look at Ahab and another king in Israel. And I'm going to have some things on the screen for you, but we need to remind ourselves of who Ahab was. Who was he? Who was his wife? And so the Bible says, this is going to be at the end of 1 Kings 21. It says, but there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And so it was, when Ahab heard those words, that he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. Now, King Ahab had recently been defeated by Elijah. Some of you remember this story where Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal and he ends up wiping out 450 of these false prophets. Fast forwarding a little bit in chapter 22, King Ahab is looking to engage in battle with the king of Syria who has been Hadad. Now previously this king of Syria had promised to return certain cities after war to Israel. This is found in 1 Kings 20. In exchange for leniency after his defeat in battle. Now, apparently this was a very prominent city or a very uh, necessary city based on where it was situated in the country. Now, if you also recall, the nation of Israel had split after Solomon's reign, and now there's two kingdoms. So, we have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now, if you look at this chart right here, immediately you're going to notice some issues with the northern kingdom the one on the right. And this last column says, was the king good or bad? Black equals bad, just so we're clear. And so there's no good kings in the northern kingdom throughout the history of that kingdom. So we have the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. And the, the king of Israel in this situation will be referred to as the king of Israel. Scripture says, when we get to 1 Kings 22, and the king of Israel said to his servants, do you know that Ramoth Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. And so he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead? So Jehoshaphat is the king in the southern kingdom. So Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are. My people as are your people. My horses as your horses. Also, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. That's a good line for all of us to remember when someone asks you in ministry or someone asks you in life in general if you're going to agree to this thing or you're going to come along with them on doing this thing. Ask them, have you inquired of the Lord on this issue? So the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, shall I go against Ramoth Gilead? to fight, or shall I refrain? And so they said, go up, for the Lord will deliver it to you in the hand of your king. It's dangerous to be surrounded by yes men or yes women. 
And Jehoshaphat said, is there not still a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of him? And this is a key signifier of the type of advice we should be seeking for truth. Not just a prophet, but a prophet of the Lord. And so the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man. There's always a remnant. There's still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but only evil. Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. And the king of Israel called an officer and said, bring Micaiah, the son of Imlah, quickly. So the king of Israel, King Ahab, and said, there is another prophet, but he doesn't tell me what I want to hear. Sounds very similar to today that if somebody doesn't reiterate or co-sign your truth or someone else's truth, that all of a sudden that person is evil because they didn't say what you wanted them to say. But the reality is consensus does not equal truth. There's things that people have agreed on and, ha and can agree on that does not make those things true. For one time in this country, there was a consensus about slavery, but that didn't make it right or true. There is consensus today about some things, about what a person can be, how a person can be, how they can change, how they can live, but that doesn't make those things true. So the prophets were all in collusion. The prophets were all brought in, and they all said the same thing, and be careful when you're around a group of people that are eagerly affirming something that doesn't sit right in your spirit. The scripture says, Now Zedekiah, the son of Chanana, had made horns of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Assyrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. So these men placed fear, the fear of losing their own lives, the fear of losing their own livelihoods above their allegiance to the truth. La verdad es la cosa más importante. Even Micaiah, they told to say the same thing. They said, just say what we're saying. Don't make it difficult. Don't be that guy you always are telling the truth. But I love Micaiah. I love Micaiah so much that uh, I actually wanted to name our son Micaiah. Uh, unfortunately, I only produce girls. So they are here, but there's the pictures as well. And so we have these two beautiful girls, which I'm so grateful for. But Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Whatever the Lord says to you, that you should speak. It's easy to go along to get along. It's easy just to say what everybody's saying. It's easy just to say what you think people want to hear. But the reality is that truth and love should never be divorced from each other. That if I really love my kids, I'll really tell them the truth, even if they don't like to hear it. That if you really love somebody, if you really love this country, if you really love your church, if you really love any group of people, you will tell the truth with love and respect. So when you read this story, Micaiah sarcastically says the same thing as the others, but they know that's not what he really believes. And so they said, please, no, tell me actually what you really think. Well, he says, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you? He would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. See, King Ahab never even considered the reality that although he didn't like the words that were being spoken to him, that they may still be true. Truth has no allegiance to you or I. Truth is truth regardless of who chooses to believe or not believe it. And your enjoyment of the truth is not a prerequisite for truth being true. That was a tongue twister. The fact that we really want something to be true, the fact that people really push something to be true does not in and of itself make it true. If I had more time, I would kind of break down how we can determine truth. There's rules to this. It's not just a free-for-all. But truth has a purpose, and that purpose will succeed even if we deny that truth all day long. Now, 
There's times when I'm reading the Bible that I want to really transport myself there just to be in the place and see what's really happening and talk to the people that are, that are in the scene that I'm reading about. And one of those scenes is this scene with Micaiah. In my church, we've been going through the book of Acts, and there's certain characters in there that stand out, and Stephen in Acts chapter 7 stands out, and I, I began to admire Stephen because Stephen stood tall. Stephen stood tall and told the entire truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth but it cost him his life. The scripture says, Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner and another spoke in that manner. And then the spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? He said, I will go out. I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. The Lord will sometimes allow us to go to the depths of our depravity, the depths of our lies that we're believing, just so we can come back to him and come back to the truth. So the scripture says, therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. One of the prophets actually slaps Micaiah in the face upon saying this. King Ahab throws Micaiah in prison. And the king of Israel said, take Micaiah, return him to Amnon, the governor of the city, and Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, put this fellow in prison, feed him with the bread of affliction and the water of affliction. That means not clean water, not clean bread until I come in peace. But Micaiah said, if you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. How much confidence do you have? How much confidence can we have that when the Lord is telling you to say something that you can stand, as they say, ten toes down and not budge from that position? That you say to somebody that if the Lord has not spoken, then I deserve whatever's coming to me. Because I only want to speak what the Lord has spoken. So the king, in his arrogance, said, until I return in peace, which means he had not thought that the prophecy of Micaiah was in any way accurate, or did he? Scripture says, so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, and king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead, and the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle and put your robes on. And so the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now, I just have a real quick question. Because if you believe Micaiah is a false prophet, and if you believe you're going to return in peace, why do you need to play tricks? Are you really sure that your truth is the truth? Do you really trust your truth in the moment of, of despair, in the moment of reality, in the moment where everything hits home? Are you that confident that you got it right? The king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains, saying, Fight with no one small or great, but only with the king of Israel. So it was when the captains, the chariots, saw Jehoshaphat, they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. And therefore they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. And it happened when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at random, or so it seems, And struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and take me out of battle, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day. And the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians and died at evening. The blood ran out from the wound out onto the floor of the chariot. And there's many lessons we can learn from Micaiah here. But today we're going to examine the purpose of truth. So I want to unpack this in three areas. The security that truth brings us, the salvation that truth brings us, and the success that truth brings us. We've got to define some terms here before we proceed. So what is purpose? We could define purpose as the original intent for something. That if you go into someone's house. There is a chair to sit on and there's a toilet to sit on. And if you confuse the purpose for those two things, you may not be invited back. 
purpose matters. I give this example oftentimes of, of, you know, when your kids are young and you've got to replace batteries and toys and you just grab whatever's handy and you might grab, every dad knows this, you grab a butter knife, right? And you're unscrewing the screw, but the butter knife doesn't fit quite right because it's not specifically designed for that task. You can get it, the job done, but that's not what it's made for. The better tool would be the screwdriver. And so when we talk about purpose, we're talking about the original intent, not the other things that you could use these things for. The purpose of truth is the original intent for the design of ultimate reality. When we talk about what's true, we're talking about that which actually aligns with reality. It's not what you want it to be. It's not what you hope it will be. It's what actually is. When one plus one equals two, it never equals anything else. I remember preaching in Burundi. It's a small country in Africa, and I had a translator, and I said, hey, um, what's one plus one in your country? To my surprise, he said two. I was like, that's crazy, because back in Chicago, it's also two. The reality of truth doesn't budge based on our feelings or emotions. And this is a message that our culture needs to get loud and clear. So when we talk about the purpose of truth is to keep us secure, the most safe place you can be is resting in the truth because the truth is Jesus Christ. So Ahab's truth, as we see from the story, as we see from the text, that his truth did not keep him secure. No matter how strongly he believed what he believed before he went into the battle, no matter how strongly he ignored the warnings, that truth that he believed, that lie that he believed, did not ultimately keep him secure. And so when we believe a lie, especially when we make that lie foundational, In our lives, we will ultimately, or at some point, not be safe, either physically, mentally, spiritually, or all three. And this message may be for someone else you know. I pray that you'll carry it forward to them. He only wanted to bring and listen to people that said what he already wanted to hear sounds familiar to today. And this is lunacy because Ahab and anyone who does this knows that they have not received a prophecy but only a confirmation of a lie they already believe. Paul saw this, and in his final letter to his spiritual son, Timothy, he says this, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, and that time is here. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables or lies. So the king of Israel says to Jehoshaphat, backing up in the story, he says, there is still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. And the king of Israel called the officer to bring Micaiah in. I believe this is the same mindset that's running rampant in society today. See, the king of Israel, King Ahab, said, never said he wanted to know what was true so that he could make the best decision, so that he could have a proper council of advisors, as we all should. There's wisdom in the multitude of counsels, the Bible says. But that wasn't his goal. His goal was just to be right. His goal was just to be affirmed. His goal was just to get what he wanted to get. He said he hated the prophet who would tell him not tell him good things about himself. But how many of us know that we want people around us who are going to tell us the truth in love? His mindset was that if I don't win, nobody wins. And as long as you affirm me, as long as you affirm what I want to believe and what I think is the right course of action, that's all I care about. Now, I would say today, truth might be suffering an even greater fate. It's been ignored. It's been redefined. It's been totally negated as a real thing in some instances. And this is why telling people that they're wrong or why telling someone that what they're doing is in and of itself not good usually doesn't go well. Those conversations get more and more difficult as the days increase. But like I said, truth is that which aligns with reality. Now, 
In philosophy, we'd say this is a metaphysical concept, that it is not something that you can change just by the whim or change just by your understanding or change just by your belief. It is what it is, no matter what you want to think about it. When you ask somebody, well, what, do you, what do you think about this or, or what do you think about that? In our, in our culture, it's increasingly popular to hear the response, well, I feel. But truth and feel are not synonyms. And if we build our lives on the bedrock of truth, as opposed to what feels good or feels good in the moment or sounds good in the moment, then our lives can stand. Then we can stand. Not wanting to be told the truth will not make that thing untrue. Let me skip some of these for y'all. The purpose of truth is also to guide us to success. Now let me be clear, I'm not talking here about success in your job or, or success with money or success in business. I'm talking about moral success. Because true success, kingdom success, does not look like what the world says it should be. I remember growing up, my mom always used to say that the principles of the kingdom of God and the principles of the world are often, almost always, flip side of each other. That the Bible says, give and it shall be given, but the world says, keep and hold and keep as much as you can for yourself. But the principles of the kingdom of God are built on truth, eternal truth. And the same is true when it comes to morality. Now, there's another worldview that we may know about called atheism. It's built on the bedrock of what's called naturalism. Naturalism is simply the belief that all there is is what we can see, feel, and touch. But not only does naturalism lack the means to ground a moral law, it can't fulfill the desire to grow or be more moral. I love the fact, some of you are with me, that uh, football season is coming back, or is back. And when you're playing or watching football, how do you know that your quarterback, whatever team you're rooting for, the Bears if you're rooting for them, that your team throwing a touchdown is better then your quarterback throwing a pick six, which is where he throws it to the other team and they run it back for a touchdown. How do we know which one of those two is better? The way we know is because we know the purpose or we know the goal of the game. We know the objective. We know the, 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 the direction that people are going. Without the end zone, without those things in place, then there is no game to really play. We can't say if we're getting further away from or further or closer to the goal. And so when there is no objective, when there is no moral objective, because there can't be in a naturalistic framework, how do you actually know that you're getting closer to the goal or further from it? We all typically agree, and we should, that murder is wrong, but how do we actually know from our worldview, from a system, that the goal should not be the same as the goal in the animal kingdom, which is simply for survival? Thank God we've learned a little bit on that regardless of worldview. See, without a goal, moral transformation is just reduced to pragmatism. It's just, well, we agree that this works, or we agree that that works, or we like this way, or we like that way. But that's subjective. That's not objective. Subject means it comes from people or subjects. But in order for truth to be truth, it must supersede, it must originate from something above us. And if somebody doesn't believe in God, I still need them to tell me where does that source come from. C.S. Lewis is a famous writer and, and actually was an atheist for many years until he was having conversations with a man named J.R. Tolkien. You might know him. He wrote the series Lord of the Rings. And he came to this conclusion that he couldn't sustain the beliefs he had without God in the picture. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said, look, the other prophets without exception are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs. But predicting success based upon wishful thinking will likely not work. Let's do this thought experiment real quick. If King Ahab had one, how do we actually know that that would be success? I'm sure his enemies wouldn't think so. If Hitler had one, how do we know that would be wrong? How do we know that he wouldn't be right in affirming that he had success? 
There's a third law. There's a, there's a law that supersedes whatever the two groups are fighting about that governs how we should actually think about what we're doing, whether it is good, whether it is evil. So C.S. Lewis, I'm not going to read all this, says it like this. Some people wrote to me saying, isn't what you call the moral law simply our herd instinct and hasn't it been developed just like our moral, our other instincts? Now I do not deny that we may have a herd instinct, but that's not what I mean by the moral law. Skipping down, supposing you hear a cry from a man in danger, you will probably feel two desires. One, a desire to help given to you due to your herd instinct. The other, a desire to keep yourself out of danger for the, the instinct of self-preservation. But you'll also find inside you, in addition to these two impulses, a third thing, which tells you that you ought to help, that you ought to follow the impulse to help and suppress the impulse to run away. Now this thing, that judges between two instincts, that decides which should be encouraged cannot itself be either one of them. In other words, these two instincts that you have and that third thing can't itself be one of the two things. So the moral law tells us the tune we have to play. He says, you might as well say that the sheet of music which tells you at a given moment to play one note on the piano and not another is itself the notes on the keyboard, but we know it's not. The moral law tells us the tune we have to play. Our instincts are merely the keys. Another way of seeing the moral law is not simply of our, of our own instincts, is this. If two instincts are in conflict, and there's nothing in a creature's mind except those two instincts, obviously the stronger of the two must win. But at those moments when we most are most conscious of the moral law, it usually seems to be telling us to side with the weaker of the two impulses, the one that makes the least sense. Lewis goes on to say, strictly speaking, there are no such things as good and bad impulses. Think once again of the piano. It has not got two kinds of notes on it, the right ones and the wrong ones. Every single note is right at one time and wrong at another. The moral law is not any one instinct or set of instincts. It is something which makes a kind of tune. The tune we call goodness or right conduct by directing the instincts. By the way, the point is of great practical consequence. The most dangerous thing you can do is take any one impulse of your own nature and set it up as the thing you ought to follow at all costs. We have a lot of people today that have found their identity in something that's a lie. And at all costs, they're going to defend that lie. And this, as C.S. Lewis says, is the most dangerous place to be. So the, the reality here is that there must be an external moral law by which to adjudicate between these two moral choices. There's got to be a higher law, higher than us, a law superseding us, a law above us, a law that comes from a source that is not us to help us determine if the law we're following is true or not. In the scripture it said, then a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? He, so he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets. And he said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. In the NIV it says, you will succeed in enticing him. When any other spirit other than the Spirit of God succeeds, we ultimately do not succeed. But the way that the Spirit works against the Spirit of God, the other set of spirits, is that they never show you the end of the story. They never show you how it's going to work out. They didn't show the King of Israel that that death was on his doorstep. It just affirmed what he needed to be affirmed in that moment, and it led him to his ultimate demise. Because truth and the disobedience of it always has consequences. Jesus knew this well when he was talking to a group of Pharisees, and they were challenging him. And he identified the other source, and he said, you of your father, the devil. The desires of your father you want to do, 
He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in what? In truth. There is no truth in him. He speaks a lie. He speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Sometimes you may have shared the gospel. Sometimes you may have shared truth with somebody and they didn't believe you and they didn't want to agree with you. And you didn't feel good about it, but you shouldn't be surprised by it. There's a spirit of truth and there's a spirit of error. So we can either proceed from truth or we can proceed from lies. And when lies begin to sound like truth, confusion will always abound. Does anybody scroll through social media every once in a while and get a little confused about what is going on? What are we talking about here? Who can be what? Thank you. When lies are elevated above truth, disaster, death, dissension, and disunity become the norm, and we're seeing so much of this today because we've gotten so far from the ultimate truth, from the only truth. There's not multiple truths. The purpose of truth is also to save us. The king of Israel said to his servants, do you know that Ramoth Gilead is ours, but we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? And so he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. And also, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire of the Lord today. So the king of Israel asked for help. He asked King Jehoshaphat to essentially save him in this matter and then proceeded not to listen to the advice on how he could be saved. <laughs> Do we really want truth? This, 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 this pushback against truth is not a new thing, it's just getting worse. The truth is bigger, it's more important than you or myself. It's easy to say you want truth, but once truth comes up against someone's current beliefs or their current desires, Truth often suffers as a result. When we look at Jesus, we can see that he was the only one to be able to hold certain things in perfect balance, in perfect tension. Truth, grace, love, justice. See, we get those things in perfectly balanced. When I want to really lean into truth, I might inadvertently sacrifice some justice or some love. And when I want to lean into justice, I might sacrifice some love. But only Jesus could extend love while maintaining justice, while extending grace, love, and mercy at the same time and truth. Never sacrificing one for the other. And that is the model that we need to follow. The king of Israel asked for help, but didn't really want it. The Bible reads, now Zedekiah, the son of Shanana, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek, here it is, and said, which way did the spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? Very similar to the way that they slapped Jesus and said, tell us who hit you now. Indeed, Micaiah said, indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. See, Micaiah spoke the truth and got slapped in the face. <laughs> Welcome to my life. Uh, or at least the YouTube comment section. There's a saying that the truth hurts, and I don't think this is what it meant, but if it means that, then so be it. The reality of the situation is that God himself is saving us through truth. And we're trying to help others get saved by way of truth. Now, I've said before many other places that truth is not only a concept, but a person. La verdad es una persona. Turning to the truest man to ever live saves you, grounds you in truth, and reveals truth to you. It is a package deal. We don't have to pick and choose what portions of truth we have access to or what that truth will mean in our lives. When he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that is a true statement that we can rest our lives on. 
when he says in the, in the scripture that I will call you sons and daughters and I will be a father to you if you've been fatherless, this is a truth that you can live by. When the Bible says that there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved, that is a truth that we can be confident in and live by. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. This statement is a statement the likes of which has not been made before or after it. See, Jesus wasn't saying he just knew more than everybody else. He wasn't saying he's just the, the smartest guy on the block. He's saying he's something utterly unique, utterly different. I don't have truth. I don't just know more. I am more. I am the foundation for everything you choose to believe. I am the foundation for everything that is true in, world, in the world. I am the foundation for everything that is true about how you should live this life. It gets even better, though. See, because we understand this, we understand that truth has a purpose in the world. We understand that truth is a person. And see, when we're talking about physical truths, when we're talking about the laws of physics, when we're talking about light or energy or any of these things, it's not personal, it's not moral, but when we talk about morality and ethics and these types of truths, they always involve persons. They always involve people, which means in order to have an objective moral standard, there's got to be a person involved somewhere. There's got to be a person that can ground that truth that law, that reality. And Jesus says, I am that person. And because he's that person, we can rest all of ourselves, all of our knowledge, all of our being, all of our nature in him. We can literally and tangibly talk about and then rejoice in the fact that the person of truth had a purpose as well. He didn't just, just come to earth just to hang out for a few years. He came for a purpose. You, likewise, have been created on purpose for a purpose, and, and purpose made Jesus submit to the cross. Purpose made him challenge the religious authorities of the day. Purpose made him get out of the grave. Purpose made him provide a means of access into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom of truth for each and every one of us. Truth had a purpose when he came to earth, and that purpose was fulfilled almost 2,000 years ago. And our purpose is to live in truth, to speak truth, to dwell in truth for as long as we're blessed to live. As I close and as I pray, I want us to remember these lessons that we learn and we can learn from Micaiah that we need to understand the value and the purpose and the nature of truth, that not just truth is a person, but truth, Jesus, has a purpose to save and secure us, not just for now, but for eternity, and to guide us and to push us towards moral success and even success in life, to build us into a community, to build us into the church, which is the called out ones who are called to be a community of believers, called to give the truth to the rest of the world. It's an honor and it's a privilege that we all get to have. It doesn't require a microphone. It doesn't require a pulpit or a podium. It simply requires you being a willing vessel. That once you've been impacted by the truth, you have a responsibility to impact the world with that same truth. I challenge you to pray to God for opportunities to share the truth. Watch what he does. Don't believe the lie that you can only share this truth in a church building and you can't share it in a school. You can't share it at your work. You can't share it wherever you go. Wherever people are, God needs people representing him there. And wherever people are, there's going to be people with questions. And when people have lived a lie for long enough, whether they admit it or not, they often know it's not true. It's not working for them. And this is where Jesus can enter, and this is where the gospel can enter, and this is where we can enter into that person's life. 
I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, for the responsibility to be used by you. May you forever keep us dwelling and basking and living in your truth. Give us the courage and the confidence to speak truth to power, to speak truth to lies when the opportunity presents itself. We thank you for bringing us into your marvelous light, into your kingdom and out of the kingdom of darkness and lies. May you forever guide us and bless us and keep us as we go forward in proclaiming your truth. Amen.